Good morning. Okay. Welcome, uh, Sebastian, who is the first keynote for today. Have fun. That was quick and painless. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I'm here to talk about the driven developer. And there is quite a long story behind this presentation because over the last two or three years, more and more people started asking me, what should I do? What's test-driven development? What's behavior-driven development? What should drive development? And what is a driven developer? And so at some point, I, when I was asked to present here a keynote, no less, um, said, hey, let's talk about that. And you probably all uh, remember the first sentence or the first words of um, The Lord of the Rings. This tale grew in the telling, and, there, and by no means do I want to compare myself to, um, to J.R.R. Tolkien, but this presentation grew in the preparation <laughs> until it became a history of software testing and included many glimpses into the history of software development. So maybe a better title would have been a short history of nearly everything related to software testing to give a bit of perspective where are these ideas coming from to better understand which idea, test-driven, behavior-driven, whatever-driven, fits your needs best. We are going back in time, not as far back as this. <coughs> Who has an idea what this is? It's the bug. This is the first actual case of a bug being found, the famous piece of paper, like a protocol, like a lab log, uh, by Grace Hopper, who in 1947 found a moth in her computer, and the computer stopped working. And allegedly, this is where the term bug for a problem in software comes from. Okay. So 1947. To give a little bit of a context, that's 31 years before I was born. And by the way, that's me, Sebastian. Uh, I'm driven by the passion to help developers better software, or in other words, I'm a pain-driven developer. <laughs> because um, 14 years ago, when I started to work on, on PHP Unit and other tools that hopefully make the lives of PHP developers easier, there were no such tools, and I was, having, I was feeling pain while I was working on my software projects. And I knew um, from my time at university and working um, with other programming languages and other tools that this pain can be remedied with testing, with things like a PHP unit that didn't exist at the time. So for a while, I waited. And it turned out that nobody else, or at least nobody I knew about at the time, um, was writing these tools, so I had to write them myself, and that's pain-driven software development. I hope it's rare, nobody should feel pain, but that's my story, and that's um, my company, the PHP Consulting Company, together with my uh, two friends and partners, Arne and Stefan. We help PHP developers build better software with PHP. We do everything that has to do with knowledge transfer, consulting, coaching, training, but that's about as much marketing as I'm going to do. And yes, while I am the author of PHP Unit and other tools, this presentation is not about tools. If you're interested in PHP Unit, there's a second session that I'm going to give later today. But I'll tr at least I'll try as much as possible to not talk about tools, but about ideas, concepts, processes, where, and ideas where these things come from. So there are, over the years, We've had many different ideas uh, in the software engineering community at large how to make a software project successful. And remember, we started in 1947 with the bug, and we don't want bugs, so how can we prevent bugs? Probably the first big software development project about which we know how they developed software was or ran from 1959 to 1963. And by now, it's well documented how they built the software. 
Um, any guess what a big software project might have been in the late 50s, early 60s? Something at NASA? Something at NASA is a really good guess. <coughs> was the Mercury project that and eventually they built all the software parts um, for the moon missions. And if you look at how they built software at NASA in the late 50s and the early 60s, it's really surprising, at least it was surprising to me, that they were not really doing that much different than with what we do today with all the agile software development. There's a really interesting paper by Larman and Basili. They talked a couple of years ago to the, re to the developers of NASA from that time that are still alive and talked to them, how did you guys build the software that brought us to the moon? And this is a stunning statement. Project Mercury ran with a really short half-day iteration. So it was even more extreme than the processes that we have today that have an iteration span of one week or two weeks. They had two iterations per day. They were working time box. They were doing test first programming. They wrote the test first and then wrote the code, motivi motivated by the test. They did pair programming and basically everything that a couple of decades later was coined extreme programming and then many other agile processes picked up on these ideas. And then for a decade it was forgotten. Yes, we worked like that for a time and then we stopped working like this, it was forgotten, it was rediscovered to some extent. In his acceptance speech for his ACM Turing Award in 1947, Edgar Dijkstra, uh, oh no, the ACM was founded in 1947, the year that we had the bug. Um, but when he got the ACM Turing Award, he said, Well, if we want reliable software, we should not focus on debugging, we should prevent putting the bugs into the software to begin with. Sounds really logical. If I don't put bugs in, then I don't have to find them, don't have to um, get them out of the software. And that's what later led to um, what's now called constructive quality assurance. Not thinking about quality after the fact, at the end of the project, and then try to get quality in as an afterthought, but think about quality from the very beginning and try to prevent bugs. And a decade before that, we already had a really good process of preventing bugs, which was test-first programming. Write a test, then write the code, and the test will tell you that there is no bug. <laughs> and again, a couple of decades passed, and there was a big software project that we know a lot of by now, because it was very well documented in books and blog entries and articles and so on because it sparked a lot of interesting ideas and it was a project where many people that are now, nowadays famous in the software engineering community like Kent Beck um, or Martin Fowler were involved in the project. And that was the Chrysler uh, Comprehensive Compensation System, really terrible name for a project. Ultimately it failed, not really because the software development didn't work out, but because Chrysler was acquired by Daimler and Daimler said, we don't want that software, we have our own software. So in the end, software never really was rolled out. For a couple of thousand um, employees of Chrysler, they were using it, but not for the whole company and then they stopped using it. But it was during that project that people started to think about, hey, we need a better software development process and they rediscovered a lot of the techniques that we already had at NASA in the 50s and 60s and some of the ideas that Dijkstra talked about. And at least until now, we have not forgotten it again, which hopefully sticks this time around. So one of the things that came out of this um, was test-driven development. And one explanation, or the semi-official uh, explanation for that, or uh, definition, is that it's a style of programming in which three activities are tightly interwoven. They cannot be separated from each other, they're intrinsically um, related to each other, and 
that's coding, that's testing in the form of writing unit tests, and that's design in the form of refactoring. And to a developer like me, it's really hard to think about coding without thinking about testing and the other way around. And there are developers out there who say, testing is not my job, testing is a tester's job, and I should only work on writing code and putting bugs into the code. And then somebody else should find the bugs and tell me to fix them. I'm not really happy with that. Um, I'm happy that those developers are getting fewer and fewer. At least I don't meet them that much anymore, which hopefully is a good thing. And test-driven development has some really interesting and beneficial side effects. Of course, the first one is really obvious. If you write the test first and then the code that you test, then you cannot have code that is not covered by at least one test. It also reduces the risk of writing unnecessary code because if you follow test-driven development by the book, then you only write as much code as is needed to make the test that you just wrote a minute or two before to pass. And not, oh, in a year from now, I might need this other thing. I don't have a test for it yet because I don't need it right now, but I could use this, so let's write this right now. And maybe you never need it, but you have it in your code base and you need to maintain it and it can lead to problems with parts of the code that you actually need. Modifications of the code cannot lead to unexpected side effects. Well, you have tests for everything, and if you break something, chances are really high that you find out about the problem before you deploy. Um, of course, you won't stop making mistakes. We're still human, we make mistakes, but you find them before it's too late. And this is the really interesting thing. If you develop test first, test driven, you force yourself to write testable code. Otherwise, you would inflict pain on yourself. So while you're writing the code, you already have the test in place. You know, OK, I need to write the code in such a way that I can actually call it from my test. I can write. A I, you have tests that test one unit of code in isolation from all of its uh, mm -hmm. dependencies. So you write loosely coupled code. You write clean code. And around the same time that test-driven development um, became popular again, the term clean code popped up. There's an excellent book by Robert C. Martin called Clean Code. By now, there's a second book called The Clean Coder, which deals less about the actual code, but has more a focus on soft skills that um, software, developers, uh, software developers should have. And the Clean Code book opens with a definition or interview sort of style definitions from various um, software engineering um, luminaries. And I like the explanation by Dave Thomas best. Clean code can be read by a developer other than the one that wrote it, which surprisingly is really important, or not surprisingly, because code is read more often than it is written. Code that a human cannot understand can still be understood by the runtime, by the PHP interpreter, by the compiler, and it can execute it, but the code if it is not readable, not easy to read, then another developer on my team cannot understand what's going on, cannot easily make changes to it, cannot build upon code that somebody else has written. It has unit and acceptance tests. It's the unit tests make sure that the code works correctly, and the acceptance tests make sure that the code actually does what it is supposed to be doing. It has meaningful names. And those names are consistent throughout the code base. You don't want one developer to call one concept uh, one way and somebody else call it another way. It leads to confusion, leads to unreadable code, leads to uh, problems with understanding what the others are doing. Minimal dependencies, which are explicit. Not using static methods, for instance. Not interacting with global state. 
I want to look at the signature of a method at, of an API and see what the dependencies are so that I can replace the dependencies with something that looks like the dependency for testing using stops and mocks, for instance. Also means that I can just replace one part um, of my application with a new implementation without having to make changes throughout the system. There's a really good non-technical description about what test-driven development is. You can compare it to double-entry bookkeeping, a bookkeeping technique that ha has been around for a really long time now. And yes, to some degree, if you're doing unit testing properly, you're doing the same thing twice. You write code that actually executes your logic, and you write code that verifies that the log logic works correctly. So in a, in, a, um, in a way, you're stating every bit of logic of your software in two places. And it's very similar to double entry bookkeeping. You have your assets and you have reliabilities. And if the balance sheet doesn't balance out, then you have made a mistake somewhere. And if you run the tests and the tests don't work, you have made a mistake somewhere. 2001, what happened in 2001? A couple of people met at a ski resort in Utah. Really beautiful area. I think that at some point they actually went skiing, but they worked on the Agile Manifesto for a couple of days. So that this was people like Kent Beck and Martin Fowler. They came there, they met, they shared their experience from the Chrysler Comprehensive um, Compensation System project and other projects that were picking up on ideas from that project. People that had defined Scrum, people that had defined extreme programming and other agile software development processes met and discussed what common concepts of their software development methodologies are. One of the motivations um, for m actually meeting and writing a manifesto in the end uh, is given by Kent Beck in an interview. We wanted to heal the divide between the developers and the non-technical people in the project. We wanted to better the understanding between those two groups, that the developers really understand what the business stakeholders want from them, what the software should be doing, what their problems are, but also the other way around, that the business people understand the problems and needs of the software developers, that they want to refactor once in a while instead of adding yet another feature on top of a workaround, um, and so on. And the four main points of the manifesto, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. And the important thing is that they say that they value the things on the right, but they put more value in the things that are on the left. Yes, you still need a plan. But just because at the start of your project you made a plan for the next 18 months should not mean that you follow that plan without changing it when the world around you changes. And just because you have a contract shouldn't mean that you don't communicate anymore after you signed the contract with your customer. About a year later, a new software development process or testing technique came up, acceptance test driven development. Um, probably based on an idea by Ward Cunningham, or very likely based on an idea of Ward Cunningham, I only found one source where they said maybe somebody else had it before him, but maybe he just made it popular. I don't mind Ward Cunningham probably came up with acceptance, uh, acceptance test-driven development. He definitely came up with the concept of the wiki and the metaphor of technical debt. And it's very similar to test-driven development, but that it's not about 
just the unit tests that make sure that one unit of code or all units of code in your software work correctly, but looking at the big picture. Does the software actually do what the customer wants? Does it meet the acceptance criteria of the customer? And the tools, remember I didn't really want to talk about tools, mm -hmm. but the way that acceptance test driven development, at least in those early days worked, was that you had something like a wiki where in normal English language you would write down your user stories or acceptance criteria for the software and then you linked parts of the sentences to pieces of code that would run and exercise the application. And this was um, the origin of um, fit and fitness and tools like that, just to name um, a couple of tools. Again, don't really want to talk about tools. As developers, um, we tend to get really religious about some tools. and I want to avoid that as much as possible. So we distill acceptance criteria into automatable, uh, automatable tests expressed in natural language and link parts of those sentences with code and wire keywords to code during implementation. So we not, and that was the new thing about it, we don't go and translate this natural language into code because if it's code, it's harder or impossible for the non-technical stakeholders uh, to understand what the test actually expresses. In 2003, a guy named Dan North was teaching test-driven development a lot uh, to his customers. And he got a lot of questions that he did not want to answer on the first day of training. He wanted to answer them on the second or third day of training. And he was bogged down in a lot of irrelevant conversations that he didn't want to have because in his opinion they were derailing uh, his training. And at some point he applied a workaround. He changed the words. He stopped talking about tests. He was still teaching testing, but he didn't use the word test anymore. By 2004, this process had a name. He made the connection between how he was describing the thing that Kent Beck coined test-driven development and the structure of his conversations with the stakeholders. And he came up with a vocabulary of given, when, then. Given I'm on this website, when I click this button, then something should happen. And he called this behavior-driven development. Given some initial context, when an event occur, occurs, then ensure some outcome. And then between 2005 and 2009, he iterated a lot, both on the process and on the wording. At some point, he had in the, in my opinion, horrible description of what it was about. Um, he said BDD is an outside-in, multiple-layer, multiple-stakeholder methodology, which is <laughs> a lot in not a lot of space. And people were confused by that. Then something else ch uh, changed before we got a better definition of what BDD is. Um, a subgroup of those that were at the meeting in Utah in 2001 met again. And they realized that they didn't accomplish everything that they wanted to accomplish with the Agile Manifesto. And I think this observation by Robert C. Martin um, yeah, makes it really clear what their motivation was for, for the software craftsmanship movement. They saw a lot of de-emphasis on quality of code and practice, good practices, best practices in software development uh, in the Agile movement, which led to the fact that lots of developers wanted to go out of Agile projects because they wanted to write good code and not code 
um, in a way that their agile project manager wanted them to write. So it fractured into two movements, and the software craftsmanship movement uh, preserved the coupling of practice and culture. So yes, the culture was still agile. We are flexible, we can adapt to change, but we want to write clean code. We want to write good software. So they basically um, expanded on the ideas of the Agile Manifesto. Not only working software, but also well-crafted software. Not only responding to change, but steadily adding value. Uh, and so on. Around that time, a brilliant book came out by Steve Freeman and Ned Price, Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. And one of my favorite insights from that book is that running end-to-end -end tests, an end-to-end -end test is a test that exercises the whole software from one end to the other. For a web application, that means instrument a real web browser that sends a real HTTP request to a real web server, delivering a real HTML, JavaScript, CSS-based page back to the browser, and then evaluate that response in the context of the browser with rendering, with JavaScript, with interaction, and then decide whether or not that test was successful. And running such an end-to-end -end test tells us about the external quality of our system. There's an interesting distinction between internal quality and external quality of software. External quality is what the end user cares about. Does it look pretty? Is it fast enough? Does it do what I want it to do? Whereas internal quality are those aspects of software quality that the developers care about. Is the code easy to read? Is the code easy to adapt, easy to extend, easy to test? Writing these end-to-end -end tests tells us something about how well we understand the domain, how well we understand what the non-technical stakeholders in the project expect of us. We can write down these end-to-end -end tests in such a way that the test looks like or is almost natural English language, and then you can show that to a non-technical person and they can say, yes, this is exactly how I want this aspect of the software to behave, or no, you misunderstood me, maybe I was not clear enough, let me change that in a collaborative way uh, with you. And then on the technical side of things with regard to internal quality, writing these unit tests gives us a lot of feedback about the quality of our code. If our code is not clean, if our code is not well crafted, <coughs> if it's not testable, writing the tests will tell us this. It makes it painfully obvious when the code is not clean because it will be a real pain to write tests for it. And running, finally, our unit tests tells us that we haven't broken anything that used to work. About 2010, we finally arrive at, at least in my opinion, better understandable definition of what behavior-driven development should be. It's a refinement of practices from test-driven development and acceptance test-driven development. We apply the five whys principle, asking five times why something should be um, the way it should be to really understand um, what the non-technical people want from us, to each proposed user story so that its purpose is clearly related um, to business outcomes, then implement only those behavi uh, behaviors which contribute most directly right now, which add the biggest value right now to minimize waste. Minim waste meaning code that I may need in a year from now, but I'm not yet sure um, if I'm going to need it, or at least I, I know that I don't need it right now, so don't write it. Use a single notation to describe um, what we want to improve communication. 
and apply these techniques all the way down to the lowest levels of abstraction. And I didn't really want to talk about tools, but at some point I have to talk about tools. Um, a common mistake, in my opinion, is that developers choose a single tool to do all of this, to really go down to the lowest level of, ab of abstraction, which makes no sense, if you ask me. There are many different tools out there that all have a purpose for which they are suited best. So pick and choose for each test where it makes sense, uh, which tool makes the most sense to use for this particular test, and have a more, little bit more uh, information about that uh, in a bit. Yes, a warning. If you follow recent discussions about software testing, there has been a huge, I don't know how to call it. Discussion is probably too polite, but uh, in the last weeks and months. And more or less, it all started a little while longer ago um, with a statement by Robert C. Martin where he said the Rails community, Ruby on Rails, has adopted the strategy of writing hordes of Cucumber tests. Again, I didn't want to talk about tools. Cucumber is a really popular tool coming from the Ruby community, but also used, or can also be used for other programming languages, um, such as PHP, for instance, because it doesn't really care what language your web application is written in. And Cucumber allows you to write natural language descriptions of what a feature should do, what its behavior should be. And then it can run that um, against your website. But most commonly, tests that use Cucumber or Behat, which is the port of Cucumber for, for PHP, are implemented in an end-to-end -end way. Even when it's not necessary to test the whole application. And this leads to slow and fragile tests. Slow because it just takes a lot of time to set up the browser. For each test, you start a new browser. You have the latency between the client and the server. It's slow. It's not milliseconds like with a unit test. We're talking about seconds or minutes. I once um, worked with a team where running their full suite of end-to-end -end tests took 23 hours. And if running your test suite takes 23 hours, you're not agile anymore. You cannot make a change and run the test to get immediate feedback whether or not you have broken something that broke before. And eventually, the company broke. Not only because of this, but if you ask me, this was one one of the contributing factors because they couldn't react to changing market requirements. Their competition was moving faster. Their competition had better crafted software where almost everything could be tested on the unit level or in a smaller scope than just end-to-end -end tests. <laughs> and these tests, and this is probably even more of a problem than that they are slow, these tests are fragile. If you change something in the template, if you change an H2 tag to an H3 tag, a test might fail. And you, with your test, you don't check the markup or you don't check whether or not it's rendered cor in a certain way. You test business logic. And if you can test your business logic only through the front end, and you make a change to the front end that has nothing to do with business logic, and your test fails, this really diminishes the value of your tests because your tests fail due to changes that have nothing to do with what the test is testing. And there are many rules, if you want to call them that, I would just call it best practice and, and common sense in test-driven development that really keep you from writing tests that couple you to unnecessary parts of the system. If you just want to test something that has to do with your business logic, with your domain logic, with, I don't know, an object that represents a bank account, 
or an object that represents something from your business domain has your business rules in it, then don't write a test for this that has to go through the whole system. It's slow and fragile and doesn't give you good results. And then he goes on, if you're doing behavior-driven development, which is good, has lots of good ideas, but don't throw the good ideas that we have with test-driven development out of the window. All the rules for good test design and decoupling still apply. You don't get a special license to create bad code just because you're doing BDD. <laughs> and then recently, like a month ago or so, this happened. David Heinemeyer Hansen, the creator of Ruby on Rails, blocked test-driven development is dead. Long live testing. And his opening statement of his blog, really long blog post sounds like, I don't know, yeah, a group where you go when you have a problem and you introduce yourself, hi, my name is David and I have a problem. And his name is David and he does not write software tests first. I refuse to apologize for that anymore, much less hide it. I'm grateful for what TDD did to open my eyes to the concept of testing, but I've long since moved on from the dogma. I rarely unit test in the traditional sense of the word, where all dependencies are mocked out and thousands of tests can close in seconds. It just hasn't been a useful way of dealing with the testing of Rails applications. Now, I am not someone who likes to talk badly about other people's software, especially if that software is open source. I have never worked with Rails or looked at the code of Rails, but this one sentence gives me the idea that test-driven development and unit testing hasn't worked for him because the code of Ruby on Rails does not lend itself in a good way to be tested and developed that way. I don't know, um, but just that, that's just the feeling that I get. I test active record models directly, letting them hit the database. Well, that's what you do if your code doesn't allow you to test your business logic in isolation from the database. And then Uncle Bob uh, responded with a blog post where he said, well, if you trust those integration tests, Dave, if you trust them so much that you're willing to deploy when they pass, and if they execute so quickly that you can continuously and effectively refactor and clean up the code, then do it. But I don't believe that this is the case because my entire experience in this field of software engineering, and he has been around for a couple of decades, tells me that there is a very, very little chance that you can succeed with just these large tests. Talking about tests in different shapes and sizes, there seems to be this theme going on that people really like pyramids to describe different categories of tests. So the, uh, the pyramid on the left just has two categories, business-facing tests and technology-focused tests. Technology-focused tests are tests like unit tests that tell developers that their code works correctly. But just because the code works correctly does not necessarily mean that the developer really understood what the code was supposed to be doing in the first place. That's why we have business-facing tests. And these tests are written or can be written and should be written in such a way that they can be understood by non-technical people. And talking about tools, this would mean in the PHP world that you would probably use a tool like BHAT for your business-facing tests. Write as few of them as possible and as many of them as you need. The foundation of your pyramid should be many, many, many unit tests that test your domain logic and your application logic and your infrastructure code in isolation from each other. 
Those tests are really, really fast, give you good feedback. And there's a similarity between all three pyramids, that the lower you are in the pyramid, the higher the isolation of a test is, and the faster the test can execute. And the higher up in the pyramid you go, the more confidence in the system as a whole you get from a passing test. A small test points you directly to where the root cause is. Uh, yet the larger the scope is in which you are testing, the less information you get where the root cause is. It's still valuable to know that a certain feature does not work, but the more code you execute while a test is running, the more places you have to look um, for the root cause. And just in case you're wondering why the pyramid on the right is missing the tip, that's the pyramid um, from Google's book, um, How Google Tests Software. And there are two explanations for why the tip is missing that I have heard so far. First one is Google has three categories of tests, small, medium, and large, plus a fourth one which is called humongous. And you have to make your pyramid really humongous to fit the word humongous in the top. <laughs> And the other reason that I've heard is humongous tests are so expensive that not everyone is allowed to run them. So we cut them from the picture to not give people ideas. <laughs> Take your pick. I really like the idea of labeling tests small, medium, and large. One of the most important things to think about <laughs> when writing tests, when testing your software, is finding the smallest scope in which you can test what it is that you want to test. And in many cases, it will be that you have to write a large test that starts with a browser, goes to the web server, goes back to the browser. And there are good tools for that. Selenium, for instance. But the original in intent of Selenium was not for really front-end testing, it was for browser compatibility testing. Does my application work in Firefox, in Chrome, in Internet Explorer, in Opera, and so on? Does it work everywhere the same? Know what the purpose of the tool is and find the smallest scope in which you can test. Write many tests that test just one unit of code in isolation from everything else. Such a test will give you the most valuable feedback. The next bigger thing that you can do is test two components, two units of code in collaboration. Just because the unit on the left is tested in isolation from the unit on the right and the other way around and everything works fine does not necessarily mean that they work correctly when used together. There's a famous example from NASA from a couple of years ago, um, where they sent the probe to Mars and it crashed while trying to land. And within a week after that crash, they figured out what the root cause was. So the, the software for that probe, for the navigation system, was developed by two teams. One team was based in the US and the other team was based at ESA in Europe. Both teams rigorously tested their parts of the system in, isol in isolation from the other team's part. They didn't write a single integration test. The integration test happened as a disintegration test, if you will, <laughs> while it was trying to land on Mars. And the teams had not really communicated well with each other. One was using the imperial system, one was using the metric system. So the surface of Mars was suddenly there sooner than the poor probe expected. <laughs> so just unit tests, not enough. Just large tests, not enough. You need the right test mix. Billions. Close to a billion. Billions. Yeah. It was really expensive, yes. Yeah. And the root cause was lack of communication. Yeah. It was not really a technical issue. It was communica bad communication that led uh, to a technical problem. And if you have a unit of code that collaborates 
with other units of code, which has dependencies. If you want to test, in it, test it in isolation from the, those dependencies, use stubbing and mocking. And the next bigger thing after that, after testing two units of code together, is not taking the whole system. There's something in between called edge-to-edge -edge testing, which means as end-to-end -end as possible without leaving the context of your language runtime, which in our case is the PHP interpreter. This means not using the real browser, not using a web server, but trying to invoke the application with a faked request and get a response back in a single process without actual HTTP um, connection going on. Much quicker than an end-to-end -end test gives, has a tendency to give more valuable results, but requires that the application is designed in such a way that you can instantiate the application and inject a fake request. Most frameworks nowadays in the PHP world allow that um, to do. And then, of course, the largest thing that we can do is real client-server end-to-end based testing. I started 15 minutes late. I've, it looks like I'm finishing only 10 minutes late, so that's good. I'd like to leave you with a summary um, by Rich Martin what effective or what makes a test effective, and he has three criteria that I find really valuable. He talks about high fidelity, resilience, and high precision. And a high fidelity test is one which is very sensitive to the defects in the code. If your tests don't break when you break something in the code, even if you have 100% code coverage, that can happen. It shouldn't happen, but it can happen. If your tests don't detect that, that's not a good thing. It diminishes the trust that the developers have in the test suite and at some point will stop writing tests because the tests don't detect when something breaks. Still, stuff breaks in production. My test should have told me about that. This is useless. I'm not doing it anymore. A test should be resilient, meaning it should only break when the aspect of the software breaks that it is supposed to test. It should not be fragile. Just because I changed something in the front end template should not mean that a test for the business logic um, fails. And it should be precise. And that's the idea of testing in the smallest scope possible. The less code you execute during a test, the less places you have to look at to find the reason why the test is failing. The test should exactly tell you where to start looking. Okay. And with that, I'm done. The slides will be available there. Feel free um, to ping me via email or on Twitter if you have any questions. And I'm also going to be around after this presentation. Thank you. <laughs>